All right. Uh, we're very uh, happy at the Cleveland R user group to host Trong Le today. Um, she's based out of Philadelphia. She's a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania, where she's using machine learning uh, to tackle biomedical problems. And she's author of multiple R packages. Today, she's going to tell us all about uh, data visualization and how we can improve our visualization. So uh, welcome, Trong. Thanks very much, John, and thanks for the um, wonderful invitation here. Let me try sharing my screen. Do I get a thumbs up? Perfect. Um, yeah, so again, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm actually, I've been on a move a little bit and um, I'm actually currently in North Carolina, so in the middle of a road trip, but um, taking the time out to, to meet and talk to everyone today. Um, yeah, so today I'll be focusing on visualization mostly for academia, but I hope that some of these principles that we discuss is gonna um, you know, translate to, to other fields as well, industry and so on. So um, please you know, interrupt me if you have any question. Um, I'm gonna keep track of the chat somehow. Let me see if I can pop that up. Uh, sorry. I can see the participant, but chat. Ah, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So I'll be asking some questions and uh, hopefully people will respond. Um, I know that being on video and talking is a little bit intimidating, but if I have a question, maybe people can type the answer. Um, okay. So yeah, um, it's gonna be, you know, there are many, many wonderful visualization talks out there. Um, this one is going to be more, here are some concrete examples of, here's a bad chart, here's how I think it could be improved and um, some fun ggplot tips. Um, I hope, I, yeah, I hope that, um, if you don't learn anything, maybe some, some, some R tips would be helpful. Um, but yeah, so let's get started. Um, I, I started this slides with with this pie chart and if you see these all the all of the words hey Jude yeah na 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 so this is basically um the hey Jude lyrical compos compositions and I'm showing this pie chart because um I want to start out saying that there's no hard rule on any of the visualization I may be very very opinionated very opinionated about something, but it doesn't have to always be true. So, you know, you, you're, you're the one who make the judgment. And, and so, yeah, I, I'll be talking a lot about different principles here, but just keep in mind, it's going to be, um, your, you know, uh, you, you, you can, you can adapt that to, to your own visualization basically. And, um, this is another pie chart example um, by my dear friend, Jake Riley, uh, who tweeted this and said, this is the only pie chart I ever find acceptable. Um, I thought this was really funny, um, but also very creative. Another creative use of pie chart is actually to show the Thanksgiving pie recipes. Um, so I, I thought this was, this was really cool as well. Um, and so yeah, point is rules don't always apply. There's some, other rules like never use 3D. Um, I think this is, you know, generally you want to simplify the data, you want to visualize it in 2D um, or even 1D if possible, but that doesn't mean that 3Ds are, you know, useless. Um, and um, I'm sure you guys have all seen Tyler Morgan Wall, um, the beautiful, beautiful animation of, you know, these 3D visualizations and, um, Sure, it, it can probably be done with, you know, just this one on the right with a 2D, but I think the, the 3D does give you this, you know, depth um, perception, and I think that's that's really cool, and it's easier to be uh, communicated as well, you know, showing policymakers how seawater level changes um, over time, for example. So that, that was really neat. Um, another rule people use is, uh, like to say, don't, don't use more than six colors. And um, again, I think if you do it well, um, this is a quite a busy chart, but because they, they incorporate um, many other principles that are good with charts, um, it's actually very readable. So I encourage you going to this um, link 
Um, by the way, the slides are available at um, Our Lady's Data Viz. So yeah, if you want to, if you want the slides, um, you you can go there as well. Anyways, um, yeah, I, I highly recommend you read this article. Essentially, you know, um, it talks about these are the most um, these are the principles that people like to talk about, but these are how you sometimes need to break them. Um, with that said, I'm going to dive into some of the things that I think are really helpful and really powerful in communication with charts. And um, again, take it or leave it, but um, I, I hope this is helpful. Um, so again, my name is Trang. Um, why am I here? Uh, I basically just have made some very bad charts and um, I wanna share my experience and hopefully um, it's gonna help uh, some of you as well. Um, so, okay, so first I kinda wanna learn a little bit about everyone here. Um, I, I've gone to, to many of the meetups, but um, haven't really been actively participating. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you would type in the chat what your favorite R packages are, um, just so I know if we're using, you know, ggplot or some other packages. Limma, is that is that gene expression, John? Okay. Yep. I just typed that in as well. I like, I don't know what DVI is, our best. Nice, cool. Well, thanks everyone for, I just wanna really see that you're there listening, um, <laughs> but okay, awesome. Um, but yeah, if I, I don't know what DVI is, but if you um, have not seen Gigi Pomological, it's a delightful package. I um, highly encourage you to check it out. Um, okay. Uh, so I think one of the first important principles to keep in mind is um, to reduce the cognitive burden of um, in within your chart. So you generally have a lot of information you want to communicate. And I think one way to reduce the cognitive burden for the reader is, um, you know, whether you reduce information, um, you highlight the things that you want the audience to focus on. Um, those are the things that would help a lot. And so, for example, um, has, if, if you have not seen this chart, this is um, actually a Python package um, that helps you visualize Shapley values. And in this particular case, this is visualizing risk of hypertension of one individual. Um, and you can see, you know, these are the, um, you know, the serum uric acid value, um, urine protein, aged biopsy, like all of this these features are contributing to this risk of hypertension. And, um, you know, you can see that all of this, uh, these red features pushing the risk up and all the blue features, you know, pushing the risk down. So I, I just think that this is a really, really nice example of a chart that utilizes a lot of um, principles that we're, we're going to talk about now um, that helps reduce the cognitive burden. So the first thing that you would notice here is that they use direct labeling. So we don't have, you know, on the side here, you know, red is higher and blue is lower. They directly label that on here. And I think that's that's very easy for for the, the, um, the reader to associate that the, the color with, you know, where, where it's going. So um, direct labeling is really powerful. Um, they also reduce the number of labors, uh, li labels. So what you see here is essentially there are many, many more features that are not being indicated here. They just show you the, um, in the red, they just show you the top four features that are most important. So I think, again, we have a lot of information, right? Um, but, you know, we, we want to focus on the most important so that, you know, we don't overwhelm them. I mean, imagine if we have 100 features in here and try to write them out. Um, so reduce number of labels and then um, highlighting. Um, and this is kind of in the vein of, of reduce the, the, the label. So, you know, they highlight like this is the most important um, uh, feature, the, the age at biopsy, and then, you know, urine protein is the next. <clears throat> Also later in, um, you know, with this package, and, and I actually seen this in, at a, in a paper, um, later in the paper, they use the same 
color scheme for a different chart. So again, that that I think um, is important to have some consistency. You know, whether it's in a paper, whether that's you know within your presentation, um, if you've used red somewhere, um, try try to keep that and don't you know reverse it. Um, I think one time I, this is back in you know Trump versus Biden um, campaign and and. I, I saw one chart that had red to represent Biden and blue for Trump. And that was just, it messed with my so much. So um, yeah, just again about consistency. Um, but yeah, really nice package if you guys want to check it out. Um, okay, so now to everyone who has talked about um, Gigi Blot in the chat earlier, um, can you give me the terminology that Gigi Blot uses for something called small multiples, like, you know, these charts right here, when you actually have multiples, um, I'm gonna say that word, but yes. <laughs> yes, when you have multiple facets, um, exactly, of, of these blocks. And so this is, facets, I think, is also an extremely powerful um, way to separate the chart and, and um, Again, kind of focusing on that reduced cognitive burden, you know, getting the the audience attention on one of them first, and then okay, now that they understand that part, you kind of build that up with the next facet, and so I think that's really helpful. Um, some of the really nice uh, argument in facet grid is scales and space. Um, and I want to mention it here because particularly for space, for example, it took me so long to figure out um, how, what, what I want for, for my chart. So let me just show you real quick. So this is a, a chart that I, I did for a recent um, preprint that we published. Um, not peer review yet, but we're close. Um, so in this type of a GG plot, you see these would these would be called strips. And so if you wanna you know, um, change the color of the strip or something, um, that's what you would put into the theme function. <clears throat> um, to, so space equals free would allow you to have um, different width for each facet. And I think that's helpful. And then um, scales equal free would allow you to have different values. Um, so as you can see here, the ticks are sites on the left side and then the countries for the right side. Uh, side. So scales equal free allow you to have that. Otherwise, if you don't have this argument, um, the default would make you put like all the countries in the first left as well. And it's just kind of empty. And then all the country, um, sorry, all the sites on the right side as well. So anyway, um, just want to put it there. Maybe my explanation wasn't that great, but uh, read up the documentation and, and hopefully that, that would be good. Um, so yeah, it's extremely useful to improve simplicity. The next principle that I want to focus on is identify the key idea. And I think this is, you know, some, sometimes we have a lot of things in our data and we first want to, you know, explore it and we don't want, uh, we, we don't really know what our story is yet. We don't really know what, you know, the punchline is yet. And we just kind of like plot this and that's fine. However, if you are going to show that to someone else, I think you do need a message behind it. I think um, once you identify your message and identify the key idea, um, then find the best way like, you know, come back to your chart and sit, think, okay, is this chart that I plot, did, did it really communicate that well? Um, let me show you some example. Oh, oh yeah, so first, um, this is a really nice visual vocabulary from, um, what is it, the Financial Times, I believe. And um, so I recommend you go here if, you know, you're just interested in different types of charts and, you know, you once do you have an idea and now you say, okay, I want to um, show a change, for example, like how do I show that um, over time or not over time, you know, what would be the best idea? So I think this is kind of like the glossary that, that you can refer to um, once you have that key idea. But, um, okay, so here's some examples. This is uh, I, I took this, um, I believe, from a nature um, genetics paper. Um, and 
obviously it's really busy as you can see. Um, DOL stands for day of life. So this is, you know, data on infants essentially. And this is, you know, day of life three versus day of life zero and then day of life seven versus day of life zero. Um, all of these very hard to see are genes, all these nodes. Um, and some of them, you know, well, they classify these genes into um, participating or, well, I guess maybe not all of them genes, but they, they would have, you know, meta me metabolic nodes and they have um, proteomic nodes, transcriptomic nodes, and then novel nodes. Um, but again, extremely hard to see. What I can basically get from this figure is that from day of life, um, from day three to like day seven, it seems like the network gets busier and there may be more nodes. Um, and yes, that was essentially what was in, um, mentioned, described in the text. However, like in the main text, but like the caption just kind of described that these are the networks. So I think, you know, this is overcomplicated, <laughs> again, my opinion. Um, if I were to uh, communicate that, you know, the, the network, you know, essentially from day three to day zero becomes really complicated, really uh, highly connected. Um, then maybe I would use some Instagram or site bar chart for each comparison. Um, and obviously the trade off here would be, I can't see the node size um, and the edges are not shown. But then again, do you see any edges <laughs> um, in, in the original chart? Um, but yeah, so, you know, something like this, again, direct labeling, um, metabolome to be red, proteome to be green, transcriptome to be blue. Um, and then, you know, just show here the, the number of nodes for that particular category. And it would tell the story just as well. And we're not so overwhelmed, we save some space. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's one example that I think could be improved. Um, okay, this is, this is a little bit more challenging. Oh, John said these are often called hairball plots. I have not heard of those terms, but I guess <laughs> um, I, I've, I've definitely seen, you know, gene expression network. Um, uh, but I, yeah, it's it just all of it in there is <laughs> not usual to me. Um, okay, so this chart is a little bit more intense. So just bear with me here. Um, Okay, so each of these facets, um, now we know what facets are. Each of these facets is a gene. And um, right here, we're showing the feature importance of that gene for a particular machine learning pipeline that I had modeled. So I, I know that's a lot, but essentially, you know, the X axis, it's a pipeline. It's, one, two, three to 10 pipeline. And then, um, you know, so for example, right here, you see that this gene PYGM is really important in pipeline number one, but essentially, is, you know, have no importance in two to 10. Um, similarly, you know, the second gene right here, very important in pipeline number two, but you, you know, you, they don't really participate in other model um, that I built. So, <clears throat> It's okay. It's it's not ideal because I can't. I, well, first of all, I don't like box plots that I only see one line. That that's just a lot. <laughs> um, a, a lot of you know empty box plots here. And so the the way that I redrew this was to have the gene on the y axis and then the pipeline on the x axis. And the information that I'm ignoring here is kind of the, the variation of that gene. So this is not just like one pipeline, this is one pipeline running many times, you know, I think a thousand times in this case. And so, so I'm ignoring that variation, I just take the median, but I think that still communicate what I want the audience to, to understand. So, you know, pipeline number one, um, have this gene that is really important that we discussed. And then we also see the connection, right? So we see like, okay, that's, but besides that gene, we have two more genes that are important in that particular pipeline as well. Um, so yeah, the, just again, going back to, um, and I forgot, oh, are these called kind of like upset blot with like some heat map? <laughs> um, it's not, you know, it's not so important that, you know, you know, all of these names, I, I think I just kind of 
um, did not like the box plots, and so I kind of I, I had to um, re, 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 re that, redo that. Um, but yeah, and you can you know again represent the importance with the um, the color shades and everything as well. So, uh, what are the arrowheads on the box plots account for? Oh, I didn't even see the arrow. Uh, oh, I think that's just outliers, <laughs> which is not very good <laughs> to be pre presented as. Um, yeah, I, I believe the, these are, um, I, I shouldn't call them outliers, but you know how box bot, the Geom box bot would, would um, make these points into. So I think that was um, my collaborators just decided that oh, it might be good to put them into, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think they are outliers. Um, okay, yeah. The next one, um, and I've seen this quite a bit, um, uh, especially in you know, the simulation world where we would have uncorrelated data in orange and then correlated data in blue, and then you would want to like look at the mean um, and standard deviation, essentially trying to see how different these distributions are from each other as this variable R abs um, increases. So <clears throat> again, it's really hard for me to see, you know, these standard deviation lines here, the orange dot and the blue dots are very um, close together. And then you know, the, um, the mean, the dash lines are essentially on top of each other um, for many cases. So it was really hard to see. However, um, we can redo it like this. So, you know, you would line up the values that you want to change. And then you can see not just with, you know, relative to each other, but you can see as R increases that, um, you know, uncorrelated data does um, stays the same, and then the other ones, um, the correlated distribution goes to the left. So, um, yeah. And anyone knows the name of this plot or this type of plot, like what or what package you would use in ggplot to? Yes, yes, it is. It is density. Yes, yeah, so it is density plot. Um, but this is also a rich plot where um, it's very similar to the facet. So if you put all the facets on top of each other. It's essentially um, the same, except you, you're you're allowing you're saving some space and you're allowing this um, top part to be kind of overlapping each other. Um, so yeah, so the these type of plots are called um, ridge plots or jo joy plots. Um, nice. Okay, and yes, each one of these would be a density. Okay. Um, the next one, this is actually a good chart. Um, it's from basic, uh, it's from this, this paper um, titled Basic Statistical Considerations for Physiology. And basically what they're trying to say is that if you have paired um, comparison, then make sure that you coordinate them. Um, you know, it's not just like, a, you know, if without these pairs, you should see a downward motion, but that doesn't mean that it's, everything is, um, is going down. So if you have pair, like maybe it's better to visualize the difference um, from after and before. Um, and so I think this, this plot is fine, except if it's a paired t-test, then you may as well um, ignore the box plot, right? Because the box plot really doesn't really do anything here. We, we not, we not, you know, worry too much about the um, distribution of one particular population, we're really seeing that we really worry about the changes of each individual in that population. So <clears throat> I would ignore the, the box plot and I would um, rotate this difference so that the difference would be on the x axis. And then I would actually, you know, instead of a box plot here, I would do a density plot. So this is basically what I did. Um, for a, a slightly different context that I have, I had two models, wanted to compare their performance, um, you know, and again, you see that, okay, most of the time model B performs better, um, or when it performs worse, it's not, it's actually not that much worse. Um, 
and then we can, you know, we can take a look at the performance of model B minus model A, and then we see that um, a lot of it is, is green. So that's a good thing. Um, this is a very tiny um, change that I'm going to make on this plot here. Um, this is, oh my gosh, to explain the result of this study is um, very interesting. But anyway, um, we, what, what we're seeing here is the um, brain predicted age. So, so this is the age of a person um, predicted by uh, from their structural MRI data, whereas this is their chronological age. So, you know, like I'm 29. That's like um, the just calculating based on the year, the birth date. And um, what we show is that essentially ibuprofen um, has some effect on lowering the brain age um, in that particular moment. So it's it's very interesting data. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the results, um, but as you can see, you know what what we wanted to show was that you know, this placebo and 200 milligrams of ibuprofen versus 600, uh, 200 milligrams of ibuprofen and 600 milligrams of ibuprofen, um, you kind of see that, okay, the circles are usually on top um, and essentially that's it. Um, but a few things can be done here. First, the slime can be a lot softer. I, I didn't need that to be, I, what I wanted to show, you know, that's like when brain age um, and chronological age are equal to each other but it doesn't have to be so sharp. And also, um, what else? Oh, yeah, the ratio can be the same. Um, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. So, you know, I kind of want this, this ratio X and Y to be a ratio one. And then finally, um, this is a very minor adjustment, but the 200 milligrams, I would fill it in with a smaller circle and then the 600 milligrams would be filled in with, with a bigger circle. Um, so yeah, just kind of like minor tweaks to, um, to, the, to the chart, but it, it makes it cleaner in a way because I don't have to use the blue color. And it also show, it, it, well, it's also colorblind friendly and um, yeah, just using one color is, uh, um, I think, better. So yeah, simplify your information. Um, I'm not going to go through this, these slides, but you can feel free to um, go through these. You know, um, this is a little bit statistics heavy. Um, so I skip this. Um, the last, maybe one of the last points here that I want to show is, um, hey, thank, thank you, John, for sharing that. Um, paper different. Uh, when when we represent something on you know paper or print something, um, it's different than than when you're trying to present. Um, so there are a few points here. I wonder if people could start typing in the chat what they think is, um, you know, one of the most important points um, that we should keep in mind. Um, and you know, when we present something and not just copy and paste our paper charts or figures into the presentation. I'll, I'll give you guys a few seconds here. <laughs> John saying that copy and pasting is so convenient. Indeed. <laughs> Size, yes, Krista. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, so that means even more information. So John is saying that um, we have less time to absorb in the, in the presentation, yes. And so, yeah, um, usually the figure is you, we want less information. You really want to highlight um, the things that, that we want to say. Um, okay, let me go through some more of these points. Um, so exactly the amount of information, um, we talked about text size, Annotation, right? Usually, um, I may, 
I'm again, sorry, I'm coming from the academic world. And so I, I have these figures that, you know, I don't get to annotate anything. It's, you know, very scientific or something. And I don't get to go in like, you know, point an arrow and say, look here. Um, so, but I think when I present that um, to, to, to the audience, I can point things and it's even easier if I just, you know, instead of using the laser, I just already have it there in the chart. Um, so annotation, highlighting, um, try to avoid abbreviation, I think is one of the big things also. Um, in the paper, you know, you have introduced the abbreviation somewhere um, above and, you know, maybe the audience in your, in your presentation would know as well, but maybe instead of using that abbreviation, just use a simple word. Um, and then you can kind of utilize builds. I know some people don't like these, you know, one, two, three steps for, for one a slide, but I think um, it could be really helpful to allow the, especially with the facets, I think it's really helpful to allow the audience to focus on one facet first, and then you like, you know, you either zoom out or, or you add enough to the facet and you say, okay, so this is it. Um, so let me show you an example that um, I'm very excited that this paper finally got published. Um, but uh, let me explain this chart for you. So we have here in the x-axis, the years um, from 2002 to, um, to uh, 2019, I believe, six, seven, eight, yes. And um, on the y-axis here, we have the estimated composition of um, the authors of each race. So uh, race ethnicity. And so, <clears throat> Here we see, you know, um, in highlight, being highlighted right now is the white, um, the, the authors, the composition of authors that are white from across years. And we see, um, you know, this Asian and black that I'm not highlighting right now, but um, we're focusing on the, the, the um, white authors first. And then now we're looking over to the right side, we have these are the fellows and keynote speakers um, at the International Society for Computational Biology conferences. And um, as we can see that white scientists are overrepresented um, you know, across years. And then Asian scientists are underrepresented, um, even though you know, the, the um, proportion of Asian scientists are um, improving or increasing within the past years in the literature world, but they're not being recognized. And we don't have enough data to say otherwise, uh, to, to, to conclude anything for other um, uh, race, ethnicity. So um, so yeah, I just wanna show this as an example to um, the, as, you know, using the builds, um, I should have annotated more, but um, yeah, just kind of focus the audience attention to one thing. I think in the paper, I have like a little bit more information, but yeah, so simplifying it and, and um, it, it, it'll, it'll be really helpful for the audience to understand what, what you're trying to say. Okay, um, so we talked a little bit about annotation. Um, this is in the Financial Times and um, I'm not gonna spend too much time in this chart, but I do want to point out that in the, um, so this is essentially the basic chart, but in the article, um, they did put in, you know, over here is more death and large economic hit. Over here is fewer death and large economic hit and so on and so forth. So I think just kind of having, I understand that this chart is really busy, but if it's, you know, presented in an article, the um, people have time to get a read, you know, maybe they don't really, understand GDP, maybe don't, you know, don't really um, look at the Y, the X axis um, annotation here. They just kind of see, okay, so, you know, these countries are having more deaths and having a, a larger economic hit compared to, you know, these countries. So um, just, just helpful. Um, this is early on in the pandemic. And so um, one of the annotation here reads, many Asian countries barely realize really well. And, um, and then the title is important too. Um, so yeah, just again, all together, I think we, we ignore annotation um, and 
um, we rely on you know what we want to say and so we just kind of put all of these basic like the base chart on a slide and not having um, anything else and just kind of push everything else into the main text, but maybe, um, you know, sometimes it's good to kind of highlight and, and add arrows and um, point out what you want to say. Um, this is also a really cool uh, chart that I saw. I've never heard of this Waffle chart until this one. And um, her name is Isabella. This is in a blog that she, she did um, called My Life in Months. And she essentially draw out her her um her life and so that was that was i thought really cool really very lovely um annotation that we have here um yeah so it's great um another tool that um i actually i have i really i, I thought about, about this i really like it but i haven't really had time to um play around with it so much it's called gg annotate and basically what it allows you to do is you can draw arrows in your chart and then it would actually generate the code for you to copy and paste that back into your code. Um, so that's um, is kind of neat. I checked the GitHub package yesterday and it hasn't been active in the past eight months. So I don't really know if um, they still working on it, but um, yeah, just, just something to keep in mind if, if you're interested in drawing um, arrows in your charts. Okay, so this is one of the exciting slides I have here. Um, so this is a Tidy Tuesday data set um, that is about mobile, uh, like mobile subscriptions. And um, we have here the, um, the countries or entity, and then we have um, GDP per capita, um, mobile subscription, total population, this is, you know, very basic data frame here. I don't think I, yeah, there's another column I, I can't show here, but um, so yeah. So if you're not, if you're familiar with GGBot, um, great. If you're not, um, essentially, you know, it allows you to draw things, layers on top of each other. And, and I think that's really nice. Um, so right now I'm, <clears throat> declaring the x-axis to be GDP per capita and then per capita and y the y-axis to be mobile subscription and um, now I add the points <clears throat> you can I don't know if everyone knows this but essentially you can add aesthetics outside the ggplot function as well I, I learned this um, on a ggplot flipbook and I thought that was really neat um, so yeah so right now I'm adding size color um, annotate uh, uh, legend. Um, I like the scale color cardo. Um, it's from a package called R color cardo, I believe, or cardo color, um, and it's colorblind friendly. And I, I really like the the way it looks. So, um, and then you can hide the um, scale size continuous guide equals false here. Essentially, let's let me go back. So right now it's showing total population but now it doesn't show that anymore. So maybe you don't want to show, you know, you just, maybe that's something that you would write in the text or something, but the, you know, that may be too much. Um, legend, you don't want to communicate to, to the audience. You can use um, any kind of transformation with your um, uh, scales. So in this case, you know, scale X, you can even do this with scale size or, um, yeah, and anything that takes continuous, you can transform that. So in this case, I use the ggplot function um, and transform it with log 10 to make it linear. Uh, percent format from the scales package and other formats in the scales package is amazing. You can um, use percent format for the, oh, you can use the other format for the axis and then it's percent format for the y axis here. That's what I'm using. Um, you can add labels. I like being minimal. Um, and then you know you can rearrange the, the legend to be on top here instead of the bottom. Oh, sorry, instead of on the side. 
GG highlight. I, I don't know if you guys have seen this, um, but um, again, we talked about you know this highlight principle and graying everything out and highlighting. It's hard to read. I'm, I apologize for that. But essentially, we're highlighting we're highlighting here you know the the countries with mobile subscriptions larger than um, 1.7, uh, which is uh, 170 percent. You could also use uh, you can also use GI Light to um, in in um, uh, with face it wrap and what it does is that it would gray out every other it would plot everything for you but it would gray out all the other points that don't belong to that category in your face in your facet and so I th I thought that was um, a really nice use case of um, of GI Light. Um, the only thing that I did not do very well here is that you can see that um, Oceania is like blending in with the gray out. So I should probably use some different color for, for that um, continent. Um, but yeah, so just some quick, some other quick ggplot tips. Um, you can use theme set at the beginning of your script um, and theme update to, um, you know, add this at the beginning of your script and then everything else, every single plot, you don't have to do, you know, plus theme minimal or plus, um, you know, theme I, legend title equals element blank. I, I generally don't like the title as you can see up here. I, I, um, I did not have the, uh, let's see if I can go back. Right, like earlier it has like a continent for the title here, but it's kind of obvious that Africa, America, Asia are continents. And so I, yeah, so if it's obvious, just just ignore it. Um, great, or yeah, uh, set element blank to the legend title. Um, and then I don't like how many grids it has so many times. And so generally I put the grid minor to the element blank. Um, uh, this is a neat trick, I don't know if, um, you guys know this, but you can add null at the end here. Um, and the goal is that the idea for this is that, you know, if I don't like this theme black, white, and I want to great, like I want to comment that that out, that out, this whole block of code would still work. Um, so I don't have to, you know, otherwise without this null right here, I would have to come back, go back, back up here and like um, put a comment in front of, sorry, put a, um, pound sign in front of this plus sign um, for the code to run or like highlight it weirdly somehow. But uh, if you plus no at the end, um, it will allow it to run. Generally at the end, I kind of go back to my script and like clean up these nulls, but it doesn't it doesn't hurt to be there. Um, this is kind of similar if you use pipe, this is similar to um, piping it to um, the curly braces dot close curly braces. So, you know, you um, say transforming your data frame, you're wrangling with it for a while, and then maybe there's this one last action that you may or may not want. And you want to test out, okay, if I comment at that last line, what does it look like? And um, if I have it, what does it look like? And so, but instead of having to like come back to the pipe operator above it and comment that particular pipe operator out, you can just pipe everything to this curly braces dot curly braces, and that would um, uh, help. So I, I hope not everyone knows that already. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so another thing here that um, I promised that I, I, show, I would show you how to do the ratio um, of the X and the Y axis to be similar. So right now you see that this is zero to 200% and this is zero to 120%. And this is shorter, but if you go to like 120 here, this is a lot shorter than that 120. So the way to do that is, oh, my bad, um, to use chord fix. And um, you just, all you need to is set the ratio to be one. And that's, that solves the problem for you. Um, Ah, okay. So if you um, ever, you know, draw maps, I highly suggest using the SF package. It's really, really nice. And also I recommend using this um, projection, which is an equal earth projection. Um, and it's, it's really nice. It um, doesn't give, you know, bias uh, 
projection, like having the US in the center of the globe. Um, and uh, yeah, it's one, one of the newer ones that I, I really enjoy using and it, you know, put the equator line where it's supposed to be and so on. So, uh, okay. Uh, okay, so one thing that I struggle a lot with ggplot um, is null, false, na, and element blank. Like, when do I use what? Um, unfortunately, I don't have any good tips for it. Uh, maybe someone should write a, a cheat sheet for this. But um, I would generally use, if I want to have no um, x axis title, like y axis title, I would say labs y equals null instead of y equals empty string because. If you do empty string, that means something is still there, and and the the chart itself would still like, you know, make space for that. Um, null is just a little bit cleaner, I think. Um, and this fill equals null just means don't give any title for the um, legend on fill on the fill color. Um, this is equivalent to, you know, if you go to a theme, you say access title Y equals element blank, legend title equals element blank. That's fine. I just find this a lot easier to write. Um, and I don't have to memorize all of these other arguments. Um, ah, okay. I, this still works, the first thing. And I, I used to recommend people to, you know, do guy equals false, but apparently today I check and it's already deprecated. So now we use guide equals none. Um, so yeah, um, again, I think this is a little bit cleaner to write like guys fill equals none. Um, but if you already have, you know, scale fill continuous, you're already doing some sort of transformation in this function, um, you know, maybe you reverse the direction, direction equals negative one or something, then you may want to just go ahead and write what guy equals none. Um, but yeah, those two things are equivalent to each other. Um, I do not recommend using limits. Um, and the reason is because if you use limbs x equals, if you use this first thing, x equals, you know, uh, vector 20 into na, y equals vector na to 40. What it does is essentially it chop the data before performing any additional um, statistics. So for example, if you do box plot or if you, you know, do geom smooth, um, it essentially gives you a false idea of what the data actually is. Um, but there is still a way for you to show only that range of the data, but you know every statistic is still computed correctly. Um, and that is to use chord cartesian. Um, and so you would use chord cartesian, x lim equals you know, that vector and y lim equals that vector. And this is, um, I, I recommend using this. I learned this from um, Jake's talk um, and I highly recommend you check his talk out if you want to dive more into the ggplot um, tool toolkit. Um, and then just know the difference between geom call and geom bar and geom histogram. I, I see people sometimes use this, um, especially between these first two, and I still have problems with it. Um, but essentially, one is um, I believe geom call draws the um, the value that you give it, but geom bar is like doing the counting behind the scene for you. Um, I generally count myself <laughs> and then I just want to make sure and it, like I use geom call to actually um, visualize that number. But um, yeah, so just be careful. If you use geom bar, um, know that it's like, you know, um, counting for you. And that's again, different than his fan. Um, similarly for geom point and geom count as well. Uh, one hard thing I learned um, was geom jitter actually jitters both in the x and y axis by default. And uh, this is, you know, retrospectively very obvious, but at the time I really expected to only jitter on the y axis because that's kind of the, the oh, sorry, on the x axis because that's the, the way I wanted in, uh, to, to view the data. So just yeah, make sure that if you use geom jitter, go to documentation and, and, and set the um, the argument um, the way you like it. Um, 
I don't have much else to say. Um, very quick on color here. Um, uh, if you want to use um, colors, I would recommend using colorblind um, uh, friendly uh, palettes. And, um, you know, the Veritas now is incorporated in Gplot. And so if you have continuous values, use Veritas. Um, if you have discrete values, again, depend on kind of what you want to visualize. Um, I like um, our card color cardo that I mentioned earlier. Um, for discrete values, um, you can use colorblind R. Um, yeah, it's, and again, if you have more than seven colors, maybe, you know, it's time to think about a different way to visualize. But if you really think that you, you have to have, you know, this 10 colors that's really necessary, um, I, I, you know, you can come back to the Veritas and, and use like Veritas discrete if you want. Um, but yeah, if you have more than 10, or, think about, oh, how can, do I, can I highlight some of these? Can I gray out some of the other ones and just highlight the, you know, the categories that I'm interested in? Um, this was a blog for Jake's uh, Simple Colors package. Um, I, uh, it's, it's really helpful if you um, have a color in mind and, and, you know, instead of figuring out like, like blue, what is what does it look like? Or if I want it a little bit greener, um, what what does it look like? Um, so yeah, it it basically just have the saturation, hue, and lightness. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. I um, and yeah, and I think this is helpful for like color gradient. Like if you have you know from zero, you want that to be white, and then you want it to go to a certain color of your choice, then I think single colors is really helpful. Um, uh, this is another blog from my own package called Tree Heater, uh, or Tree Heater, and uh, I wanted to write this because I could not find a nice package in R to um, draw uh, decision tree. And so I incorporated the decision tree itself with the data. So this is the heat map of the data. Um, this is the decision tree. Um, everyone's probably already familiar with Penguin, the Penguin data set. Um, so this is just a way to, for, for you to um, visualize the model with the data itself, which I think can be really powerful. Um, and it has, you know, it has some certain characteristics here, for example, you can see, you know, how big are each of these nodes in the decision trees and um, what, uh, how, how accurate they are, right? So like um, this node particularly, it's pretty good in um, saying that it's a deli, but, you know, some chin strap is, is still here in this node as well. Um, and in general, you see like this, the, the Gen 2 penguins, um, which are on the Biscoe Islands seem to have, seem to be bigger. They have bigger uh, flipper and bigger Coleman and so on. Um, so yeah, um, check it out. If you work with decision trees and if you want to, um, you know, just do something very quick to show um, that you want to teach someone this or decision tree or um, yeah, just want to draw something fun um, for you to check it out. Um, okay, I think this is all the resources. Um, I, I I read a lot of this stuff and I really like them. Um, I know it's a little bit overwhelming to look at the list here, but um, yeah, if you um, if you're interested, I highly recommend you know just checking these um, resources out because they they're really helpful. Um, that's it. That's all I have. All right. Thanks very much, Trang. Um, that's a great presentation. I learned a lot, a lot of good little tricks there. Um, I hope everyone else learned something too. Um, let's open it up for questions. Um, I'll get started. So you'd mentioned you, you didn't like box plots. Do you like violin plots any better or do you have the same issues? I didn't like box plot for that particular, um, visualization of the data that I have. Um, but yeah, I generally it's, you know, if, if you have enough data, box plot is probably good enough. Um, 
if, sorry, take me a little bit to scroll back here. Um, the things that I skip is essentially the differences between box plots and some other, sorry, let me see if, let me just exit out this. It doesn't let me do anything. Ah, there we go. Oops. Oh, wow. Sorry, it's jumping everywhere here. The, I had that kind of stack of slides that um, talk about bee swarm, violin, box spot, um, and some some other things that I, gosh, I want to show here. Sorry, hang on. Yeah, okay. Right, so this is, um, this is called the Cena plot, this is bee swarm, this violin plot, bean plot, box and whisker plot. Um, I think, you know, you, you, we kind of have to be, um, well, we, we want to, it, it's a hard balance because we want to represent the data, right? So if, if you use jitterplot, for example, this is literally the data. Um, but, you know, do we do we simplify it into a box plot so that the, the audience, under, again, you know, simplifying the information so that the audience understand um, the data better? Or, you know, do we try to give as much, like be as truthful to the data as much as possible? Um, and you know, visualize it something like bee swarm so that they can actually see like where everything is and how big the variation is. Um, but again, you know, our eyes can trick us sometimes. So you know, maybe I see that this is lower variation, but maybe it's not. Um, so yeah, I, I, it it depends on the data. Um, I wouldn't say I hate box plot. Um, if I have enough, you know, if I have like a thousand data points, I I wouldn't mind drawing a box plot for that. Um, but yeah, that's assuming that it's not multimodal. Um, but that's another story. Yeah. All right, anybody else you can unmute yourself or throw it in chat. Hello. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I learned two new things today. Uh, the space equals free option for the faceting um and the gd annotate package i was about to ask something about that um one question that i have and i don't know john if you let me share my screen for a second um yeah no problem okay all right you should be go host okay all right so um, let's, I have a small example here, right? Simple density plot. I just have a normal random variant and I'm computing the, um, you know, quantiles basically. Um, and let's say I wanted to highlight the 95th, uh, the, the central 95th percentile, right? So everything greater than or equal, or greater than 0.0275 and less than, 0.975. Um, how would I do that? Like my intuition would say like, okay, if I move the fill into uh, here and set the fill based on this uh, segment variable that I have here, um, you know, then it should highlight that for me. But what that does is it splits this up into three, right? Um, if I set group equals to one to try and keep it together, well, it doesn't actually, um, uh, you know, fill it. I, I saw you had a, an example of this. It, you were comparing model A versus model B, something like that, and you had a, like a vertical line splitting with two colors in the fill. How did? Could you tell me how you did that? I honestly forgot how I did that. Um, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I the, the code is available online on github so let me see if i could pull that up real quick um my guess is that i use some sort of geo ribbon 
or um, let me give me 30 seconds and if I can't find it, maybe I'll follow up with you after. Okay. Um, I cannot find it. Oh, sorry, but I'll 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 drop my um my the link to that study here. Okay. Um, cool, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, we can um yeah maybe if 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 you leave your email or something, I'll <laughs> message you after. But yeah, I, I mean it is doable. I. I, I just, I don't remember how I did it, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It seems like it's a geom, but that doesn't make sense. Geom smooth. No, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it could be tough when you want to do something slightly different. Um, so, Trang, when you are trying a bunch of different things, do you ever use the percent plus percent? I always want to use that, and I feel like it always ends up causing me more headaches. Do you know what that is? That like the re you just change the data. Um, like if you have a plot oh. and it's not working, and you want to change the data a little bit, you like save it. And you take the plot object you present here. I can put it. Um, I think I've, I think I've seen people use it. I I forgot what it does. It just replaces the data. So whatever the data frame is, without you having to rewrite the whole thing. Like if you have a big ten step GG plot plot, you can save it as like P, and uh, plot P, and then you can say P that thing new different data frame that I've tried a new normalization on, or I filtered or something. And it'll apply uh -huh. to all the same stuff. Um, huh. It's something right. that I, I try to use effectively, but I feel sometimes that maybe I should just copy paste. Um, so I was curious if you had a if you had a take on it. I haven't used that yet. Um, I yeah, and that that is really hard to type. So I, <laughs> if there's not a shortcut for it, I, I I would not use it very much. Yeah, I have to like do my own shortcut for that probably. Um, but no, I I, I check it out definitely. Thanks. All right, any other questions? Hi, yes. My name is Andres and I work at Progressive along with Alec. Um, and one of the problems that we run into is ggplot2 takes forever to render when you have like millions of data points, like mm. we currently do. Is there anything that you can that you've done to be able to run ggplot on like 5 million data points other than random sampling like a thousand points? Because that's usually what I um, end up doing anyways, because I can't render a 5 million data point ggplot um, graph. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a smart way to do it. I mean, <laughs> sampling um, and yeah, I, that that may be a better question for the ggplot team. Um, but I, I do agree, it takes a very long time sometimes to um, to draw it down, especially with with the large amount of data that like you have. Um, but I mean, sampling is not a bad idea. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just definitely. Uh, I'm always whenever somebody talks about ggplot two, I'm like, how do you make this faster? Because I I just pretty much sample, and that's pretty much. The only thing that I've been able to do. So, yeah, what's thanks. the uh, what's the alternative? Like, what else do you guys use to visualize? SAS. That's is the that, only. That's is it the a lot only, faster? Well, at Progressive, we I like to say we have SAS on steroids. Like they have like literally invested millions of dollars onto a SAS server that like, it, I mean it works, but 
I'm like, I don't want to do, I don't want to use SAS. So I'd rather use R, but yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious if the base R is a lot faster. I, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but, <laughs> you what know, about, unfortunately. Um, oh, are you talking ahead. about scatter plot, Andres? Mm -hmm. It's like a scatter plot. Would you be willing to do one of those ones where it's like the density, like it's a bunch of little hexagons and like, um, so it's, a, it's a, like a grid of hexagons and then the, like the opacity of each hexagon is like the density of points in that. Is there a sample? Um, I'm trying to think what that name of that, does anyone know what the name of that plot is? Um, uh, GM Hexpin, right? Yeah, Hexpin, yeah, like that, like this, right? So that could be, you know, that could be a millions of points in there <laughs> But all you really want to show is this linear relationship. And so what it does is bin it so you can see where the majority of the data is and you can still see the relationship between the two variables. Um, but that's going to plot way faster than, um, than rendering. That makes sense an option I can do. So geom hex. Yeah, because it's a... Uh... <laughs> Sometimes sort of, I'm just like, you know what? I'm, I give up and I'm like, I just sample a thousand. But you, and that's the thing, it's like you generally sampling is fine, but when you are talking about five million data points, you can sample a thousand and you can just randomly sample um, the end of the distribution. So yeah, definitely. So I'll try geom hex. Again, whenever anybody talks about ggplot2, I ask this question and I've gotten some very complicated answers. I'm just like, I, I just need something simple. But yeah, I can try geom hex. Good, thank you. Another tip for lots of points, this is regardless of what you use, but make sure you always use raster graphics like PNG or JPEG. Don't ever export that as like a PDF. Is that, that will be painful. <laughs> Agreed, that, that's a really good answer, John. Yeah. All right, okay, great. Um, well, thanks so much, Trang, for, for being here. We all learned a lot. Um, thank you for the questions and your attention. Uh, but yeah, we'll meet